Good morning. morning. Welcome on this day the Lord has made to those of you who are in the room and those who have joined us electronically. I know if you've read your bulletin, you realize that I am not Joanne Gorham. (laughs) Joanne is not feeling well this morning, so I'll be filling in. Uh, It's a pleasure to welcome back to the pulpit the Reverend Larissa Kwan Gavazio. We're glad to have you here again and looking forward to your message. There are a couple of announcements. Ken is an announcement. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm here representing the Return to Church Committee. Uh, as you know, we've been meeting diligently for over the last two years, and we're finally getting to the point where some su- significant changes are coming. So what I'm about to say to you was approved by the Ar- Return to Church Committee and by session. Uh, number one, the whole harmless form still needs to be filled out if you haven't filled it out. It's a one-time form. Once it's done, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, Number two, we have, if you didn't notice the sign, we have two new release forms. They're identical, just on different pages. It's a sign in the list. If you can answer no to the three basic questions, uh, just sign it and uh, phone number and we're good to go. So that will continue for the next foreseeable future. Um, And again, that's for groups and for, our, our worship. But the biggest announcement is this. Starting May 1st, next Sunday, masks will become optional. Okay, so it's entirely up to you if you want to wear it or if you don't want to wear it. Now, we still want to keep in mind the concern and safety of our members. So if you think you need to wear it, wear it. Uh, but as of next week, no more masks, unless you think you need it. So I'll be around if anybody has any questions or anything, but that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you. Don has a Good morning. Um, we have tallied up our pledge cards from our uh, stewardship campaign and approximately one third of the people who pledged in 2021 have no pledge cards in our office, in the church office for 2022. So if you know you haven't yet sent it in, um, you don't even have to fill out the pledge card. If you're here today, the pledge cards are on the table at the, um, at the landing, but you can even, even send just a mail, uh, a letter by mail or an email to the church office just saying, you know, my pledge for 2022 is so much per week, so much per month, or so much per year. You don't have to have the official pledge card, but we would love to have the pledges from those of you who may just not have gotten around to it. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Good morning. morning. I am here to point out to you the announcements that I believe were on the slides and are in the uh, bulletin for our mission. Uh, The uh, blankets, traditionally we do a blanket Sunday on Mother's Day and there's a sample blanket out there. It's for Church World Service. And if you would like to dedicate um, in memory of or in honor of, these cards are on the table in the back of the worship area and you are welcome to fill them out. Um, We need to have the the information in by the 8th if you want to make sure that your name and your um, beloved's name are in the um, the bulletin all, but obviously we will take your offerings after that. Even Mother's Day, right? Okay, and we are also doing a uh, home front diaper challenge again. Lots of fun for a lot of people. Uh, We're aiming for 100 
uh, packages or wipes, all sizes, and uh, there is a correction to the end date. The end date is May 15th rather than the 24th. Okay, May 15th. And thank you. Give generously if you can. Any other announcements? Let us then proceed to the lighting of the unity candle. We light this candle to remind us of Christ's presence with us in the midst of this pandemic, connecting us all to separate places, strengthening all those serving the front lines of this pandemic, encouraging all who have been laid low. If you are able, would you please stand and join in the call to worship. Peace be with you. Jesus stands among us. Peace, Peace be, be with, with you. you. The For risen Lord, Lord is here. here. We bring all that we are to this place, bearing the strength of those who believe. The hope of those, those who doubt. doubt. The anticipation of those who have faith and yet have not seen. The fullness, the fullness of God's, God's blessing is alive and reigns in each of us. Let us sing hymn number 233, the day of resurrection. <clears throat> forgiving God. Let us now together confess our belief in a God of abundant love. Holy One, we confess too much. There is too much loss, too much fear, too much grief, too much despair. There is only so much we can handle and is overwhelming us. Help us, O oh God, to let go of the fear that holds us in its grip, and instead cling to hope. Help us, O oh God, to acknowledge our doubts and yet to trust in you. To know that you are with us, we are not alone. Help us, O oh God, to have faith that this too shall come to pass. Guide us in the name of our uncertainty to focus on you. Our God and our Redeemer. Here now are silent confessions. Amen. 
Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Christ died on the cross, but was also laid on the tomb of death for three days. Christ knows our fears, what it is like to feel trapped, what it is like to live without hope. And yet Christ rose, we will rise. Christ lives and we will live now and forever. Christ loves us and calls us to love one another. Live in his hope by loving one another and trusting that Christ is with us through all things and that we will see us through. Hallelujah. Amen. peace I give you. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And I also with you. Let us so a sign of peace. Let us pray. Almighty God, these readings are a treasure trove of great wisdom and marvelous knowledge. Open our ears that we may hear the wonders of your word. Open our hearts so that we may clearly understand your grace that you have given to us through Christ our Savior. Amen. The first scripture this morning is from Psalm 118 beginning with the 14th verse. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God. He has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. <coughs> this ends the first reading. Our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. Hear these words as well for us today. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of some of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it on my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. But Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thank Thanks be to God. God. It was never meant to be this way. I'm guessing that the disciples in today's reading were feeling like their ministries had come to an end, more so than the beginning of something new. Here they are in a room behind a locked door, filled with fear and doubt. Some were ashamed that they had denied being a part of Jesus's ministry. They turned away from the miracles they had seen, the teachings that they had learned, and the people who they knew experienced the sacred become tangible just as they had. I imagine others were probably just downright scared they had marched into Jerusalem against the imperial powers processing that same day. They had angered religious leaders who no doubt by now thought that they had squashed this growing movement. And a testimony to their authority was embodied in the reaction of the 10 men, those closest to Jesus, hunkered down behind a closed door. Perhaps all were ashamed and confused as to what to do next. Every possession had been sold. They had dropped everything to follow a savior only to realize that he might not have been worth giving everything up for at all. But then as the narrative tells us this morning, a figure appears among them offering words of love. Peace be with you. At first, they don't know that it's Jesus, the man whom they had spent years following. It's only when they see the wounds in his hands and at his side that they rejoice that he is again in their midst. And then Jesus breathes the spirit on them using the same word as the air that was breathed into the first human. The disciples take in the breath of God and then are sent out into the world. So yes, you might think, yes, this is it. This is their moment. And of course, then the once scared disciples, they step out into their community again and they preach the good news that they once again saw become flesh. Or no, perhaps not at all. Do you notice in this familiar passage that they tell Thomas, but one week later, there they are back in the room behind a locked door again. Now to give them the benefit of the doubt, maybe they did give things a shot. 
Maybe they did step out and talk with others about the hands-on experience that they had had with Jesus after the cross. But how do you explain someone coming back from the dead only to the closest of his followers? Were they making up the story? Were they trying to keep themselves from looking crazy? No doubt people would want to see for themselves. It wouldn't be surprising if people wanted proof that what they were sharing was true. And what more could the disciples give them than the simple words of what they saw? But would that be enough? Whatever happened after that first moment, eight days from the breath of Jesus on the disciples, there they are huddled together again in a room with only one another. I grew up knowing this passage as Doubting Thomas. Anybody else? <laughs> and yet Thomas was never in the room with them that first time. And I often wonder if he was out talking with people of what had happened only days earlier. And unlike the disciples, maybe he was doing his best to care for people who follow Jesus just as he did. And maybe you were just as confused as he was. He might have struggled to give them answers, facing the anger and sadness head on. Their spiritual leader was gone in all of the promise that had come along with him. Whatever Thomas was doing, he wasn't sitting in the room with the ten disciples that first time. Now, it's important to note that Jewish tradition supported individuals asking for signs of the divine. Do you remember Moses and the staff that turned into a snake or the water that turned into blood or the bow in the sky that becomes a sign of the promise that God made to never flood the earth again? Or when God touches Jeremiah's mouth so that he receives prophetic words, just a few examples, you get the idea. So when Thomas asked to see Jesus and the wounds for himself, it's not doubt, but a desire to see and experience the risen Christ on his own. And so he does see Jesus a week later after the first visit in the room. And when he feels the scars in Jesus's hands and side, he cries out, my Lord and my God. The joy, his joy has been embodied personally, his unbelief has been changed and transformed to believe. Now it seems as though Jesus chastises Thomas with the words, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. But as David Loos has said, instead it's to be read as a blessing for all of those present then to now who believe in this radically amazing story about Jesus despite our lack of tangible evidence. Now, some say that doubt is the part of faith that you just want to forget, that kind of nagging, irritating thing that doesn't seem to fit in with everything else. The thing that keeps everything from being perfect. On the contrary, I think that doubt is a central part of faith. It's how we move and breathe and live clothed in that doubt that defines who we are as believers and followers of Christ. Jesus didn't reprimand the disciples when he showed up among them in that locked room, when he showed up twice in that locked room. He refrained from yelling at them for hiding out. He didn't ask them what they were doing, wasting their time away from other people when they should be surrounding themselves as he had. Jesus didn't act sternly at all. He simply, just as he always had, loved them as they were and where they were in their disbelief. And then he still breathed the Holy Spirit onto them and sent them as a gift out into the world, broken, questioning, fearful, doubting, and yet also rejoicing, celebrating, and remembering all of that wrapped up together. He sent them out into the world. So too, Jesus doesn't come back from the dead as if the torture and crucifixion never happened. But he returns from the cross with the marks of brutality that led to his death. And it's with these scars that the disciples recognize their leader. It's as if they say, yes, the past happened. That was real. We went through that together. But so too is this moment right here, 
right now. It's just as real and tangible. So now what are you, what are we going to do about it? As I was preparing for the sermon today, I recalled um, that the last time I had preached on this familiar passage, because this is the text in the lectionary that comes every year, the Sunday after Easter, it was in 2022 at the, or 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. I was serving as the transitional pastor at Hillsboro Presbyterian Church. And at the beginning of the Lenten season, I had big plans for our journey together. This was gonna be our first Lent together. So we were using labyrinths during the prayers of the people to be traced with your finger as the yearnings of our hearts and the familiarity of the Lord's prayer were all lifted up. But at the point of the second Sunday in Easter, we, like so many churches, had found ourselves worship, worshiping for several weeks on Zoom. I went through my files and found the words that I had shared with HPC during worship two years ago, and I want to share them with you this morning. I said, friends, we certainly find ourselves in locked up, closed off spaces. Only this year, it's to remain safe and healthy. We're forced to stay in these places as people that we know and love battle COVID-19, gasping for breath and seeking strength from the virus that has taken hold. We wait from a distance as friends or loved ones battle illnesses already taxing their bodies. We cannot embrace. And though virtual means to meet, maintain a connection, it's not the same as human touch. I keep on hearing that the slow transition back to things as normal. Our lives were never meant to be this way, using our homes as shelters and wearing masks to do the most mundane of everyday tasks outside of them. Pandemic and quarantine have become commonplace words in our vocabulary. Who would want to long, who wouldn't want to long for what was? And yet the reality is that things will probably never be the same. Those of us facing the challenges of today will always remember a time when something so small that our eyes couldn't see it became one of the greatest enemies that we have ever faced. And I continued saying to them, like Christ, I don't think that we're going to get through this without the marks and scars of this sad time. And we're going to bear the mourning of those that have been lost, the social inequities that are made even more clear as we see the ways that they're illustrated in those who are healthy versus those who are ill. And we might even bear some guilt that we've made it through without symptoms or struggles. Yet these scars, these deep hurts will be reminders of the deep humanity we have learned in this time and place. These were powerful, challenging words as I reread them in preparation for our worship today. I don't know if any of us or many of us could have envisioned the past two plus years COVID would take us on, the journey it continues to take us on. Sometimes we walk the path with curiosity and understanding, while others it felt like we were being dragged along following down a path toward this kind of unknown destination. No matter what this time has been for you and the hopes you bear into the coming season, whatever that will look like, we need to take the time to acknowledge the scars and wounds and trauma from this time. We've learned a lot about ourselves, our nation, and the world. We've experienced the yearnings of communal connection alongside empty supermarket shelves and mounting uncertainty. The realities of race and racism have come to the forefront over and over again alongside a deep political polarization. Our children have missed months of socialization necessary for their growth and the impact on their education, which we may never fully comprehend until years from now. Many of us have had to say goodbye to loved ones in ways that we never could have imagined before this pandemic began. And as churches, we've grown to see what's possible when we truly worship across a vast space, bridging this sanctuary space with the sacredness of our homes to celebrate the Lord's Day. 
But gosh, we can also not wait for the day when we're all back in this holy space together. We cannot chart a course forward, whether in our own lives, in our neighborhoods, or even in our faith communities, without recognizing the marks that this time has made on each one of us. Only then can we live into the resurrection hope that can fade so easily in the background of just everyday life the struggles and blessings that we have to face. It's this acknowledgement which brings us gasping with surprise and saying like Thomas, my Lord and my God. Our triune God too went through this whole journey alongside us. And the Holy One bears the weight and marks of this time as well as Christ's life, death and resurrection has reminded us that our God has truly been through every human experience and through the Holy Spirit continues to be alongside us. I have to confess that the Sunday after Easter is always a favorite of mine. Coming on Easter morning is easy. We know the sanctuary will be filled with spring blossoms. There'll be familiar hymns that resound from our own voices and the choirs. Easter eggs will be found and baskets will be explored with eagerness and Maybe even our crisp new spring outfits will make a debut. Easter is one of those sacred Sundays when the holy is so very close and tangible from the moment the sun rises and casts its brilliant light. But the Sunday after, that's a return to the mundane. Even if we are in this season of Easter, most things return to the way they were in the shadow of the possibilities present just a week ago. So we have to remember on this Sunday after Easter, the ever present reassuring reminder, as I think I've told you all before, that resurrection isn't returning to when you thought you were happiest in your life. It doesn't hide the wounds of the past or protect us from hurts in the future. Resurrection is completely new. <clears throat> And that's what we're called to do and be in the world, living out this resurrected hope. We're still to work for justice, to loose the bonds of the oppressed, to feed the hungry, and to reach out to those in need. We continue to have faith and trust that we have an impact no matter how stacked the odds are against us. And some of this will look as it always has for the church, just like your continued support for home front families and blankets for the most vulnerable around the world. But some of it will look very different than whatever we have done before as the church. And the challenge of such differences is a nagging desire to return to what was comfortable and familiar rather than the newness that God may be pointing us to. So on this second Sunday of Easter, in this season of Easter, where we celebrate the risen Christ, here's what we need to know and remember and celebrate, that this is a story about love. Love that creeps into even the darkest crevices of the world and bears light. Love that bears both humanity and divinity to embody this abundant, complete love in the world. Love that's told over and over again across thousands of years, despite our humanness in translating its message. Love that comes again bearing its wounds to overturn the sign of the cross that was once a symbol of death. You come here, we all come here to this place together and acknowledge that this love will find us even in our locked up, closed off places, when we're hiding from everything outside, when we're holding on to our doubts and fears, when we're frozen even from taking one more step forward. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, that love comes to stand in our midst and say, peace be with you. Friends, as the faithful of um, generations, we join in proclaiming what we believe in the affirmation of faith. And so I invite you to stand if you are able and join me in these words. 
I believe in God, God the Father, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in, and in Jesus, Jesus Christ, his only Son, Son, our Lord, Lord who, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, suffered of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was, was crucified, crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Christ. Amen. Let us join in him at number 239, Good Christians All Rejoice and Sing. joys or concerns um, that people would like to lift up for our prayers today. Uh, we've been praying. Uh, I don't know if uh, we've been praying the last several weeks for Charlotte Duthie, who's a friend of Sharon Danner, who uh, is in our boat choir. Uh, and Charlotte passed away this week. So we keep Charlotte's family in our prayers and we keep Sharon and her family in our prayers too. This isn't working. Speak up. Or you can go first. Just say it real loud, Bonnie. I'd like to ask for prayers for the family of my cousin, Glenn Kinsel, my younger cousin who passed away Easter Eve. She went through a terrible time and she went through a terrible time. And I ask for your prayers for them. Can you share their names one more time? Sorry, your names. Glenn Kinsel. My cousin and his wife, Diane. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Prayers for my sister, Rita Frailinghouse, 
She has a reoccurrence of her breast cancer. Uh, uh, prayers for Carol's and my friend uh, Jean, who is now uh, hospitalized in Princeton, uh, but stabilized. Uh, but it's uh, it's serious, and we want to keep her in our prayers. Yeah. Uh, pray uh, prayers for this church because we need young people in this church. Uh, my son, he was very sad because he was the only child, not that he had a child or some sister. So we need to pray that uh, we need to invite our neighbors or friends that they should come to church. Let us join in prayer today. Let us pray. Oh God, we come in prayer today shut off in many ways. Maybe because we're weary or full of doubt or maybe even because we're eager about what's next but we're uncertain about how to get there. As we look at the sadness and pain and brokenness around us, we cannot help but sometimes doubt your presence. So we urgently search for signs of you and too often come up short from our own expectations. Yet we know that you come to us wherever we may be, in whatever locked off and closed off places that we may want to dwell and breathe the spirit among us. You enter these spaces and say, peace be with you. So may such peace envelop us in the places where we need it the most. Allow it to breathe new life into us so that we can witness to your resurrection and new life. Like Thomas, perhaps some of us demand to see for ourselves. So remind us that doubt is a central part of faith. And that through such a path, we more deeply understand our own beliefs. So may such uncertainties become roots that feed the full body of our faith. Break into our day to day and bring alleluias to our lips. On this day, we continue to pray for our communities, the nation and the whole world. We lift up our neighbors near and far who experience the impact of inequity on their daily lives. Guide us to find ways to disrupt these patterns so that everyone has access to even the basic necessities of life. We ask that the leaders around the world make decisions that seek the best for their people and that countries around the world partner to face the challenges that intersect all of our communities. We continue to pray for war-torn countries, especially Ukraine, remembering the ever-flowing stream of your justice and righteousness. May such nourishing water cut through the brokenness of humanity and bring us together in ways which value each individual as uniquely beloved. On this day, especially, we pray for Charlotte, for a life well lived and for Sharon, um, their families, friends and loved ones in this time. For Glenn, who has also passed away and for Diane and all of those who have been a part of um, their life together that um, they receive support and care. For Rita, who has learned that her breast cancer has returned for Jean, who is in the hospital, that both of them receive attention and care that they need from their medical teams, that you also strengthen and embrace them, oh God. And we pray also for the ministry and mission of this congregation as they seek to welcome families and individuals into their midst. 
in all things, God, and the things that we have had the courage to name this morning and the things that we have yet to give breath and voice to, let us be reminded that you walk alongside us and never let us go. Resurrection is not a return to what once was or what we hope things will be. Resurrection is instead something completely new. And it can be unfamiliar and uncomfortable. But resurrection is still the new life that you call us to. So may we mourn what has been lost and the hopes that must be transformed. And when we're ready, may we follow the resurrected Christ to new places and work in this world. When the words cease to fall from our lips, we return to the familiar words that Christ taught us for inspiration and hope, praying, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy thy kingdom come, come, thy thy will be done, done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Friends, freely we have received from our God of abundance, so freely may we give, not only in this moment, but also all the days of our lives. So you are invited to contemplate the ways you will share your gifts with this congregation, whether through a financial contribution or the wonderful ministries that we heard about this day.
Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing. The one who is alive and reigns with you, acknowledging that we hear our certainties alongside our doubts and fears. Come with our gifts for the week. Use the work of our hands, the sound of our voices, the power of our words, the abundance of our financial gifts, the simple act of caring for another, and all that we have to give as blessings to your creation. Amen. Please rise as you are able and join us for the closing hymn number 250. of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore.